password. And all right, you're all set. Okay, minimize that. And then resume share. And current slide. All right, should be good. All right. Good evening, everybody. We left off uh, last time. This is the top 10. Um, I did the top five very quickly. That was, uh, I'll review five really before I hit the wrong place, but that's okay. Five was uh, CQ, CQI, and we talked about that last time, uh, and I'll finish the last uh, aspect of it is number six. So we're talking about top 10 for quick review. These are top 10 EMS mistakes. Also uh, for review, you recall from last time, we did one through five, and now we'll do six through 10. And some of these are lifestyles, some of these are procedures, some of these are aspects of our everyday EMS life. And I'll try and keep uh, attention and pay attention to the questions on the right there, but we'll start with number six. And that's over treating the pneumothorax. So we have in our uh, protocols the ability for you guys to treat a tension pneumothorax. And uh, that's a basic treatment for EMS and it's a life saving treatment, but what tends to happen is because you're working in a very noisy environment, just because you can't hear or you might suspect that someone has a collapsed lung from trauma, then they don't necessarily have a pneumothorax just because you can't hear breath sounds. Now, that's not to say that you can't do this life performing procedure, but as we were doing case reviews, in our local ATAB, that's Area Trauma Advisory Board, we were seeing a lot of the paramedics needling the chest to treat a tension pneumothorax that either didn't really exist or didn't meet clinical criteria for a tension pneumothorax. And the question is, what's the difference? And uh, I'll go over that hopefully in a second here. Um, First off, keep in mind that a pneumothorax is also called the collapsed lung. And there are two types, there are several types of pneumothorax, but the two major ones you're gonna see are something that's a spontaneous pneumothorax or that might happen from trauma or a collapsed rib or a fall. But if you don't see them with actual signs and symptoms that you're having cardiopulmonary collapse, chances are that that person will be able to survive to the hospital. Uh, I'll go over the specifics of what I think are specific signs and symptoms that you need to needle the chest for. Keep in mind that this is a vacuum system. When a lung collapses, it causes negative pressure. And when you put a needle over the top of the rib, as you can see in this picture right here, what you're going to see as it penetrates the pleura is you're going to see the air that is trapped in there under pressure is going to escape and you'll usually see bubbles. Now, a lot of times uh, people are expecting to hear a sucking or a whooshing sound, which you don't always hear in the field or you don't always hear in the emergency department. Sometimes the treatment of that pneumothorax is complete, but one trick is to put a needle, as this one is, with some plain old saline in there. So as you go over the rib, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes, this is the rib, and this is what's called the neurovascular bundle down here in the left-hand corner. As you go over the rib to avoid the neurovascular bundle, and you go through the pleura and enter the pleural space right here, Right then, when the air escapes, you'll see this um, go through. You don't always hear a whoosh, and you don't always uh, 
feel this compression or hear the compression, but you usually should be able to see air bubbles in a closed system, which will signify success. I'll come back and talk to this about one more time, but these are your neurovascular bundles. That's your vein, that's your artery, and then that's your nerve. And that's why you slip over the top of the rib so that you don't hit that area, which can cause excessive bleeding. So here is a picture of on the left-hand side of the screen, what a pneumothorax looks like. And here on the right side of the screen is what that X-ray might look like if it were on the opposite side. So on this patient, it's a left-sided pneumothorax. And on this patient, it's a right-sided pneumothorax. So uh, I thought these two looked pretty close, but it's a left and a right. What can happen in somebody is a collapsed lung or a pneumothorax can be spontaneous. Sometimes those are people who are tall, skinny, they just have a spontaneous pneumothorax. Or they could have trauma to the chest where one of these ribs might nick the pleura. And that's the lining of the lung right there. And if the pleura is nicked, then the air becomes trapped and negative pressure happens and the lung collapses. The treatment, of course, is to equalize the pressure by putting in either a chest tube or a needle uh, decompression device, which we just talked about, and I'll go over a little bit further. Most people can survive with a collapsed lung, and very often we find a collapsed lung in trauma patients, incidentally, when we take a chest X-ray. Uh, that being said, um, if they get signs and symptoms of collapse where that lung that collapses causes such negative pressure that all the contents of this side of the chest starts to shift, that's called a tension pneumothorax. And I'll go over that again in just a few minutes. So this is a military picture of treatment of a neurothorax that can be done in the field. You can see it can be done with a device like this that has a stopcock on it that allows you to close off the system or hear the air rushing. As I mentioned, I prefer right here on this lower lock that you put a 10 cc syringe so that you can actually see the rush of bubbles come up and you know what you're doing. Um, the lung, of course, has three lobes as we mentioned here. A small pneumothorax can happen where air collects between the lung and the chest wall, or if you get a large pneumothorax, sometimes that can begin to cause respiratory compromise or cardiopulmonary compromise. So these are the protocols that we have in our group, our local uh, EMS agency. And the reason that we tweak these protocols, as I mentioned before, we were having a fair amount of uh, people who were treating pneumothoraces or pneumothorax where they really didn't need a chest tube in the field or a needle decompression in the field. And sometimes they were in the wrong place. Sometimes they were not even in the lung and the patient would come in with a catheter that was in the soft tissue. And I'll show you how that can happen in a minute. But the emergency decompression of a tension pneumothorax using an over-the-needle catheter is the protocol we have. Uh, to warrant a chest decompression in the field, the patient must be significantly symptomatic or an extremist at risk of death with the following. A high clinical suspicion, meaning they're not breathing well and they had trauma to their chest or they fell or they hit the steering wheel, something where you suspected that there is significant trauma to the chest. Secondly, they have to have progressive respiratory distress and shock symptoms with low and rapidly declining blood pressure. So if you have all three of these, um, then one of the following, decreased or absent breath sounds, a consistent history like chest trauma, or maybe bad COPD and they can't breathe. Distended neck veins, which you don't always see, but you can see in a tension pneumothorax. Uh, 
A tracheal shift away from the affected side, that's a pretty late sign. Um, asymmetrical movement on inspiration, a hyperexpanded chest, sometimes drum-like percussion. What does that mean? If you've ever tapped on a wall to try and find a beam, uh, and you know where the beam is on a wall because the, the uh, percussion becomes a little bit higher pitched. If you tap on the chest and you hear that hollow sound, that's what drum-like percussion is. It takes a long time to get that to figure out. So it's not something that you can do right off the bat. And then say somebody is intubated and or you're trying to use a bag valve mask and all of a sudden uh, they're breathing fine and they had mechanisms above and now it's getting really, really stiff to uh, ventilate the patient and it's harder and harder, then you might consider a tension pneumothorax. All right, there are classically two ways to do this. And again, I took this picture out of our protocols um, because I wrote our protocols, that's why I'm using them. So if you look at the exam on the right, this gentleman is the midclavicular line, the midclavicle, and the second intercostal space is traditionally where we have taught paramedics to place a needle. But I'll show you why we changed our protocol in a minute, just based on some modern science. What we've now decided to do is to go into the anterior axillary line, uh, which is this line here. So this is the axillary line, which begins right under the armpit and goes down uh, the side of the body. There's a posterior axillary line, which is about halfway between the mid axillary line and the back and then the anterior axillary line, which is about halfway between the front and the mid axillary line. So it goes right here. And why did we choose that as a site? Um, first off, this is our procedure. You'll have your own procedure. I'm not gonna read every bit of this, but essentially you're gonna have the bed about 45 degrees if possible. Um, they can be laying on their back if they're a trauma patient. Uh, identify the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. So I'm going to go back one space and that's that. That's about where you're going to be. And then you're going to use a good 14 or 16 gauge needle. Not going to use an 18 or anything smaller unless you've got a child, but a good 14 or 18 gauge needle so you can get that uh, air out. Remove, uh, once you attach it to a 10 cc syringe, partially filled with saline, as I showed you. Um, sometimes this allows time to visualize the rush of air, and sometimes you're just going to see bubbles. You remove the needle and you leave the catheter in place because that is equalizing the pressure, and then you reevaluate the pre uh, patient, as always, to see if you're doing any good. Now, here's the good news. Let's say you suspect this is the only pass that you're, only, you're ever going to get in emergency medical services. Um, and I say this tongue in cheek. If you suspect that somebody has a pneumothorax and you needle their chest, you've just created a pneumothorax. So the patient has one no matter what you do. So it's the only time in, in medicine that I know of where both the treatment for a suspected pneumothorax causes the disease you're looking for. So that's good. So that's the only pass you get. That's why we say, well, if you needle the chest, that's okay. But I wanna keep in mind, and you go back to some of the thoughts of the uh, one that we do, this protocol, you have to have these types of indications. Too often we were having somebody who just couldn't hear decreased breath sounds and they might have had a good history where they hit the steering wheel, but they really didn't have a tension pneumothorax. So this is military data. This information came from us from the um, Afghan war. And we had always done, as I mentioned, the 
anterior or the midclavicular line second intercostal space. This picture on the right is a CAT scan of how much space you have to go through to get a needle into that area. If somebody is, keep in mind that these are fit army recruits that we're talking about. So if we get a needle into the chest, even if they're fit, that's a long way to go. Most of our patients are not fit military recruits. Most of these time, most of the time they could be relatively uh, heavy, they could be intoxicated, they could be intoxicated and heavy. So you wanna look for a better way in. And what the military decided to do is they looked at the CAT scan here and they said it's a whole lot easier to go in from the side. We don't have to go in through the pectoral muscles, we don't have to go in as far. So that's why our group, based on the military data, moved to the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line. Um, yeah, anterior axillary line, I'm sorry. Anterior axillary line. So on the right is mid clavicular line and on the left is anterior approach. This just simply shows the old picture uh, of this mid clavicular line, second intercostal space. You can do it when they're supine or at 45 degrees. You're gonna use a good strong uh, 40, 14 gauge or 16 gauge needle. Uh, this is in our protocols and basically precautions. Um, often listen, uh, let me see the question here. If there was a question on NR EMT about correct site, would they accept this answer? Well, that's a really good question. And I think the, the answer is a definite maybe. So if your text varies and you only have mid clavicular line, stick with your text. Uh, however, the information as it comes through is relatively state of the art and that's where we're moving. If your uh, text says mid clavicular line, then I would stick with um, mid clavicular line. Um, I know you want to pass the national doors too. All right. Um, somebody look it up and tell me, I'm going to uh, say that science is important and uh, hopefully I just went through my boards again. I appreciate it. And sometimes our information lags a little bit behind board questions. So if your board question says second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, stick with it. All right. Uh, it's a rare condition, uh, but can occur in trauma. So be careful because you don't want to needle any chest that doesn't need it. You really should have these protocols down if you suspect, especially low blood pressure, and they have a good high index of suspicion. So I don't think you're going to get faulted on that way. Uh, non tensile pneumothorax, as I stated before, is not a life threatening uh, event and doesn't have to be uh, decompressed in the field. Uh, catheter length is about three inches. And possible complications, and this is what I said, is creation of new pneumothorax if none existed previously. But the treatment and the creation are exactly the same. So we'll go from there. Uh, it can be precipitated by the occlusion of an open chest wound. Um, those we'll talk about at some other time. That's where you use a three flap uh, bandage on the chest. Uh, if the patient deteriorates after dressing an open chest wound, you, have, you can remove the dressing. Uh, this is the same picture you saw before, just going over it one more time. And those uh, if you go over the top and you see the bubbles, that's a good idea because that way you get the negative pressure and you're, you're dealing, you can actually visually see. Most of the time you're doing this, it could be dark, it could be in a field, it could be on a traffic, there could be a traffic pattern going on, it could be raining, snowing, and it's hard to do the right thing if you can't hear the air uh, escape which it doesn't always do that 
uh, it's good to have a visual clue as well. All right, before I move on, any questions? Got it? All right. Uh, just real quick. Yes. Um, how do we discern it from a hemothorax? That's a really good, <laughs> that's a really good question. So the question is, how do you discern, uh, well, the hemothorax is essentially, you can have both a pneumothorax and a hemothorax at the same time. The good news for you is when you put, uh, when you have a hemothorax, uh, there's a fair amount of blood in there, but the treatment for a hemothorax is a chest tube not uh, a needle decompression. So you have to have a much larger bore on your chest tube. And you have to have, I believe it's about 200 cc's or 500 cc's initially, and then 200 cc's an hour. So for a trauma aspect from a uh, physician standpoint, we don't really know if we've got a hemothorax in there until we get a larger diameter chest tube. So if you can look at uh, a drinking straw and double the size of that, that's about the size of a chest tube. Uh, it's a relatively large uh, gauge about the size of your pinky or your index finger. And you're not gonna be able to tell hemothorax clinically unless you've got an X-ray in the field or you put a larger chest tube in. So it's a good one to try and think of because a, a hemothorax can call cause dullness or uh, hemothorax can cause respiratory compromise, but the treatment that's needed to truly diagnose and treat a hemothorax is a larger diameter chest tube, which you can't do in the field. Got it. Um, yeah. Concerning symptoms and also, um, we don't want to put a tube in there where we thought it's pneumo and it turns out it started bleeding out too. Um, what are the imperative points that we, sh as paramedic, that we should um, look at or keep an eye on to make sure that it's not a hemothorax that we're treating, that we're treating a pneumothorax? Okay. Uh, I'm going to rephrase your question is, how can I not mess up, right? And yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, here's the good news. Uh, if, if there's blood in the chest, it's contained. It's not going anywhere. If you put a, if somebody has signs and symptoms of a tension pneumothorax and you do a needle decompression of the chest, all that blood is not going to rush out of that tiny little catheter. Uh, the treatment for a hemothorax in the emergency department is to put in a large diameter chest tube. You're not going to be doing that. So if you think someone has a tension pneumothorax and you put the needle in the chest, essentially in the right place, essentially you're done. Um, you don't have to do the next step. That's something that your trauma physician is going to do or your emergency physician is going to do in the trauma bay. So you really don't have to worry about it as much. I hope that answers your question. But if Thanks. You, you got it? Okay. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, lucky number seven. EMS documentation mistakes. Now this is very, very important for you guys at this stage is to learn how to write a good note. Um, when I give this talk on documentation at another time, maybe we can do that in the future, I talk about two very important things. Number one, you wanna do right by the patient and follow your protocols. Number two, you want to make sure that whoever reads your chart knows exactly why you did something. And the third thing is your agency and your shift commander is gonna to come to you and go, because of your bad documentation, we didn't get paid. Now, nobody at this stage of your career at this point, you only wanna do 
the right thing and treat patients and save lives. However, when you get on the other side and you get hired, if your charts are bad and you're not getting paid, your shift commander or your captain's gonna haul you in and say, you need to improve your charts because we're not getting paid, okay? So that's one of three important things to talk about about mistakes. So first off is make sure you spell things correctly, okay? So misspoiling makes you look like an idiot. So most of you have EMRs or electric, uh, electronic medical records or EHR, electronic health records that have spell checks on them. And you usually do those once you get back to the station, sometimes they're done before you leave the ER, but very frequently I don't see those. I'll get a slip of paper that has one or two uh, pages maybe, and you wanna build confidence. And remember, it's a legal document. So if that legal document makes you look bad and you have misspellings, pull out your book, pull out your cheat sheet, pull out your phone, spell things correctly because otherwise you'll be like this guy um, getting a tattoo that looks bad. I happen to like this tattoo in the lower bottom corner that I think every paramedic, if they're gonna get a tattoo, should get. If you were smarter, I'd be unemployed. Okay, so you wanna be the smart guy. You don't wanna be the dumb guy, right? Enough said. All right. Here are the top five mistakes in documentation. Number one, make sure you have the facts surrounding the uh, dispatch documented. You wanna make sure that the dispatch protocols approved by your medical director are clearly understood. And then the dispatchers, your 911 operators must clearly communicate to the crews and the patients, the condition, and clearly those should be documented in your patient care report. An insufficient narrative of the patient's condition at the time of transport. So you, you wanna avoid narratives that simply state where the patient was picked up and where they were delivered. Uh, because then you're nothing more than a very fancy and very expensive taxi. So you wanna avoid uh, phrases such as, um, the patient was transit with, uh, transported without incident. You want your medical record to tell the story as to why exactly you transported the patient. And this is a, another fact of life when it comes down to uh, transportation. Sometimes people will call an ambulance because they don't have a ride to the hospital and, uh, and there's nothing critical about them and you have to say, you know, I think that you can, uh, you know, call a tab or call a taxi. That's gonna happen sometimes. That's another discussion for another day. But if you decide the best thing to do for the patient is to transport them, you wanna make sure that you're clearly documenting exactly why you're transporting. State the facts accurately, objectively, and completely so that whoever reads the chart, like your medical director a month or two months later, knows exactly why you did what you're doing. So was the transport of this patient by means other than an ambulance contraindicated? What does that mean? Is there any other way that the patient could have gotten to the hospital? And really your job and your chief will appreciate it is to make the patient uh, appear as um, necessary of your services as possible. So you're gonna make sure you need, check their mobility status. Maybe they're totally, they're in a wheelchair and there's no way to, they can get them going. Uh, anywhere but other than an ambulance. They might be 600 pounds and it takes 10 men to uh, transport them. That's another lecture for another day. All right, uh, their ability to transfer from the bed to the cot, maybe you have to carry them. So have crew members, if you can, uh, get the chart from your medical director so you can read the hospital admission summaries um, so you understand how to improve your charting. Vague explanation of specific interventions and procedures. Um, you don't want to ever give a, a procedure and you're not specific. 
So your patient care report is part of the patient's medical record and it's not simply an internal document. So when I go into the hospital records and a paramedic says, whatever happened to Mrs. Jones? And I go into the hospital record and I look up what happened to Mrs. Jones and I tell the paramedic, oh, that was a heart attack or it was a broken leg or something. Um, also part of the medical record is your chart. So it'll be scanned in there. And if there's a problem with the medical record, it is discoverable and a lawyer will look at yours as well. So they wanna make sure you've got everything correctly. And don't ever assume that the people who are reading your patient care record know your organization's protocols. So you're not gonna say something as if the patient was intubated per protocol. That means nothing to a secretary in Indiana who might be uh, deciding whether or not you get paid or later if the care was proper. So you wanna make sure that each and every intervention you do has an exact reasoning. So it leads into number four, that there's no explanation for specific care, clearly explaining the transport itself and make sure that that transport could be provided for no other reason except for your excellent care. And when you're going from one facility to another, what are you providing for a patient other than a taxi? You're monitoring their blood pressure, you're keeping oxygen going, you're keeping a, a watch on their um, vital signs, you're watching their coma score, you've got drips going on, and all those things can only be done by transferring from one facility to another. And your patient care record must show what professional medical care the patient required during the transport. That means documenting entitled CO2 if they're intubated or their vital signs along the way. What you don't wanna do is pick up the patient, have one set of vital signs, and 30 minutes later, another set of vital signs when you hand the patient off. What were you doing the entire time the patient was in the ambulance? So I'm gonna ask a question, which one of these is gonna get paid for? Uh, the patient was complaining of difficulty breathing, so we intubated her for protocol and transported her to the hospital code three. So if I'm a secretary in who knows, uh, Georgia, Indiana, Alaska, and I'm deciding whether or not you or your agency did everything you could to, uh, that requires billing to the level that you're supposed to do, does that tell me much? Not one, not a whole lot. Um, and the second one sounds better, that's right. The patient's having extreme dyspnea with decreasing saturations, increasing entitled CO2, indicating impending respiratory collapse, immediate preparations for intubation were undertaken to prevent loss of life. Boom, There's, you can't argue against that, very good. So this secretary, wherever she might be, who's got 12 other charts to go through, if she sees the first one, she's gonna go, oh, I'm not gonna pay, I'm only gonna pay half of what they're asking for and then your captain's gonna come running after you. Uh, loss of life, wow. What's that question mean? Does that mean, yeah, potential loss of life. That means you, you're intubating. Remember, you're doing a procedure uh, that is saving somebody's life. How does this apply to discharge to residents if a patient has only dementia? <laughs> you're asking questions where sometimes we do things um, for the good of the order. Sometimes we do things and the hospital eats the cost. That's another lesson for another day. Uh, that sounds great to a lawyer and a secretary. All right, you're great. Okay. All right, your duty is to make sure someone else reading the chart recognizes how important the transfer and the procedure was. All right, lastly, inadequate description of patient complaints. Whatever system you use, always make sure you describe a finding or complaint by pain. Document that completely. Onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and time, as well as the patient's pain scale. That's another discussion later sometimes. Um, 
Hemorrhage is another common finding that's inadequately described and do the best you can to describe exactly how much was lost if you can. All right, uh, parting advice, document the dispatch information. What is important about that is how far you went, how many miles you went to get to the patient's house, uh, did you go with lights and sirens because a code 99 was in progress? Get the correct demographic information from the patient. Complete a narrative statement. Document mileage accurately because you're going to be paid down to the tenth of the mile. And both crew members should uh, review and sign the PCR. The, what the, in, that's important. There are some places where you're going to be stuck with one paramedic, one volunteer, and uh, basic driving up front. But if you can, and you're, two, you're lucky enough to have two or three paramedics, make sure you both read the patient care report before you submit it. It's a good practice. And get the patient signature. I know you guys are good at that because I'm always uh, halfway through my exam when you guys walk in and say, would you mind signing this? And I don't mind. That's okay. I know you guys have to get your signatures as much as I do. All right, lucky eight ball. All right, missing the STEMI, calling the STEMI. So this is not a lecture today in uh, cardiac EKG reading. We can have that sometime in the future if you want. But what you do have to know is you have to be able to read EKGs properly. In our area, we have what we call a heart one, which means that the paramedic has the ability to read an EKG in the field, call the emergency department and activate the cap team. So that took a little bit of time and, and pressure, but we've gotten in our area up to about a 94 to 96% rate of calling a heart one from the field for what we call a STEMI. Uh, that's an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So you do a 12 leading in the field and our um, paramedics have gotten to the point, and this is the region, and again, my region is about the size of uh, some major states, I think larger than the state of Connecticut or something to that effect. Um, very large area for our paramedics uh, about 16 to 18 agencies, and they're very, very good at reading EKGs, and it takes practice. One of the things, though, I want you to understand is regions. You have to understand that, for example, area two, three, and AVF is an inferior. Um, lateral, where lateral and high lateral go, and then your V1 through V6 leads go from septal to anterior to lateral. That's probably a typical test question you're going to see. But you're also going to see what we call reciprocal changes. And lateral uh, reciprocal changes are very often seen with an anterior MI. So you're going to, as you study your EKGs on a different uh, plane, uh, you're going to make sure that you understand your, what we call these fireman's hats here. You can see they look like an old fashioned fireman's hat. That's the ST elevation MI. So when you see it in the field and you read an automatic EKG, you have to understand why you're calling a heart one. Every region's gonna be different. Every region's gonna be slightly uh, different in tweaking their protocols. But in our region, I feel we're fairly advanced and uh, Seattle does the same thing. Uh, Southern California does the same thing. A paramedic reads the EKG and they have the ability to activate the heart uh, one team and that patient can go directly to the cath lab. Uh, we'll go from there. So in our protocols, again, these are our protocols. Keep in mind that there are some mild changes here. Consider the automatic EKG interpretation of acute MI. What that means is very often it'll spit out a reading and it'll say acute MI. Now acute MI is not enough for you to activate the heart team. 
What you have to do then if you see acute MI is go back, reread the EKG and say to yourself, why am I doing this? Uh, we have, these are national standards. Women uh, have a 1.5 millimeter ST elevation in V2 or 3 and men are two millimeters. Keep in mind that women have more atypical symptoms than men do. We used to miss a lot of MIs in females when we weren't considering things such as indigestion or back pain, instead of the classic symptoms of crushing chest pain, jaw pain, arm pain. So women very often have more subtle signs. One millimeter ST, Elevation in two or more contiguous leads is important. And uh, the local ED calls a STEMI, that's a ST elevation MI based on the transmitted 12 lead EKG if available. Now we have the ability to activate from the field and we also have the ability to transmit a 12 lead if there's a question. Now here's the hard part. In some areas, we live in the mountains, those calls don't go through as often as they should. Uh, they're supposed to go to a secure email and sometimes they aren't seen. So very often uh, we rely on the paramedics to call the ST elevation MI and get that patient in the ER as much as possible. If you were in one of my agencies and this were a teaching uh, I would at this point insert a couple of case histories and go over good calls and bad calls, but not today. This is our uh, chest pain um, protocol. Everything I've talked about is here. Um, we've got some uh, ability to uh, talk to them. We have the 800 number here for calling the heart one. Uh, we have some warnings um, for activating heart one post cardiac arrest patients who have return of spontaneous circulation with or without ST elevation. What we usually do with these people is we usually cool them first and we get them to the meaning get them down to about 34 degrees. Um, if these patients are still unconscious, we try and get them to the cath lab as soon as possible, but most of the time we cool them first. If they're greater than 90 or have blood pressure less than an age of greater than 90, or their blood pressure is less than 90, a respiratory failure, we usually have to stabilize those people first before we call a heart one. Uh, acute stroke patients with ST elevation, you've got too many things going on at once. Uh, sometimes stroke patients give misleading uh, EKGs and sometimes you've, uh, there's a contraindication to bringing them to the cath lab. You've got to treat their stroke first. So we tell people not to activate. Of course, do not resuscitate patients and transfers from hospitals or clinics when cardiologists have been consulted. Uh, we have to, they usually know if a heart one's coming on. Uh, this is our uh, local transfer center. Uh, St. Charles Bend or other hospitals. And if available and you can, transmit the 12 lead. And then right there in our protocols, we go over where you're gonna see certain regions. So it's always there as a backup. Um, so here's an EKG I want you to look at. And you can see uh, some, it's not a normal uh, ST elevation, MI, but I'll tell you that it is an MI. So let's look at some of the regions here. Let's go to two, three, and AVF. There's some, a little bit of funky thing here, but that doesn't mean anything in particular uh, right off the bat, it's nonspecific. There's some deeper waves here, which look like Q waves. No, it's not a bundle branch block either. That's a good question. What I'm gonna ask you to is to look over here at V1, V2, and V3. Also V4. Look at these ST depressions. Uh, anterior septal, that's a good question. 
it's probably not anterior septal. Anterior septal would show ST elevations, right? If you had ST elevation, then I could say here and here and here, it would be anterior septal. Um, but here's what I want you to do. If you had Dubin's, yes, there's the correct answer. Do a right-sided EKG. If you had Dubin's, Dubin's EKG, um, textbook of cardiology tells you to take this EKG and turn it upside down and look in a mirror. I simply take the EKG and turn it upside down and look, read the back. So when I do that, watch what happens. Now, does that look more like a ST elevation MI? And the answer is, it does to me. I'm going to go back and forth. Pretty good S. We all know that those are pretty big ST depressions. But a right-sided EKG would show you the posterior aspect. So that's the correct uh, answer from Mark. A right-sided EKG, if you did one, would show you probably ST elevation in the right side. What artery is that? Uh, posterior is usually right coronary, I believe, but um, and sometimes the circumflex. All right, we're going to move on. Number nine, we got two to go. Number nine is focusing on the loudest patient first. This is strictly out of the EMS world. No, these are the people that you guys are going to see a whole lot more than I see. But this was a kind of pretty good article uh, that I read on the EMT spot. And it simply uh, talked about uh, the big five trauma scene mistakes that you can avoid. And I'm going to uh, read this out loud. I remember the call like it was yesterday. Four teenagers and a Toyota Corolla on a rural road. The car was torn almost completely in half. When I arrived on the scene, two girls remained in the vehicle. One girl was trapped in the front seat. She was screaming like a banshee, get me out of here. Her friend lay face down between the two former halves of the vehicle, and she was unresponsive and laying across the hot exhaust pipe in a large pool of gasoline. At the time of arrival, five responders were tending to the front seat passenger, and no one had assessed the face down girl. So this happens in the emergency department all the time when we have somebody who's loud and obnoxious, or we have a seizure, or there is maybe bleeding from an artery that probably really won't end somebody's life and we don't pay attention to somebody who might truly be sick. Um, and on the scene, you're gonna get hooked into treating the loudest patient first. So it's not to say that loud patients don't warrant our attention. Loud patients call to us and we need to make sure we help them, but they do compel us to abandon our training and focus totally on them and not look around the scene to see what else we might look at. Uh, so resist the surge and when you walk onto a multi-patient trauma, don't pay attention to where everyone else is looking. Look for the quiet patient and approach them first. Odds are you'll find most critical injury right there. All right, and we're on our last one. This last one, I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to give you one of our case presentation. So everybody put your thinking cap on. I'm going to share with you one of our ER um, patients and an EMS mistake. So we'll go from there. Number 10, missed injuries. Okay. Physicians go by advanced trauma life support. Paramedics go by pre-hospital trauma life support, but they both teach the same lesson. Your primary survey consists of A, B, C, D, E. We all know what airway is, breathing and circulation, okay? Now remember, we're talking about trauma. We're not going to reverse it like the American Heart Association did and get, you know, circulation first. In trauma, we're still going A, B, C, D, E. Airway, are they breathing? Is their airway patent? Are they breathing? 
If not, we fix it. Let's check their circulation. Disability stands for their Glasgow Coma Score, and that E is a big one, expose. When you take a patient to the emergency department, if anyone's ever done that, what's the first thing that we do? We wind up, especially if they're trauma, cutting off all their clothes. And that's because we're really big on this E. We're looking for missed injuries. If somebody's shot in the chest, we want to see if there's an exit wound or is the body, is the bullet still in there. Uh, if they have a deformity of their leg, uh, we want to know how far down it goes. So it doesn't matter if they're expensive rattlesnake boots, we can't get them off without uh, safely. We'll take them off and we'll cut them off. And the reason that I think that E is so uh, important is this is where missed injuries happen. Uh, they happen all the time and it's important that you make sure that you get them and let the ER know ahead of time that you might be dealing with something. It's very embarrassing to think that you brought somebody in and it's a simple problem and the ER doc calls your medical director later and says, hey, they missed a big injury and you don't want to do that. So here's my case history. A 63-year-old female who was riding on the back of a motorcycle that was going around the corner when the back uh, tire slipped out on the sand and the, they were going um, about 45 miles an hour around the curve and they hit an embankment and went down the side of the road and initially the driver of the vehicle was ambulatory at the scene and the passenger of the vehicle um, was complaining of pain. Uh, initially, she had a Glasgow coma score of 15, blood pressure was 120 over 80, respiratory rate was 16, and she was alert. Now, at the scene, the paramedic had a decision, call Air Life or Life Flight or the helicopter, which would take 18 minutes to get there, or drive 18 minutes to get to the closest hospital. The closest hospital happened to be my hospital and we're a level two trauma center. Um, we're a level three trauma center, I'm sorry. The helicopter would have brought them to our closest level two trauma center, which has all the lights and sirens and all the specialists. The only thing we don't have is burns, burn patients, so that's why we're not a level one. So everything looked pretty good and he made the clinical decision at the scene that we'll call off the air life and we'll call off the helicopter and we'll transport to the patient because it looked like a pretty, uh, from what he saw, um, non-significant wound. He noted in his uh, PCR that the patient had urinated and peed her pants. So she had some urine in her uh, groin area. There was a stick that was impaled into her thigh. So he called off air flight. And of course, en route, the blood pressure decreased to 50 over palp and the GCS declined. So let's look, uh, I'm gonna go back up. I gave you the answer. <laughs> I gave you the answer. And the question is, uh, what typically happened? And when he saw this and keyed in on the patient peeing her pants, urinating her pants, as if maybe she got so scared that she peed her pants, he came to a conclusion that she had urinated or peed her pants, and therefore he missed that, and that's called anchoring. So anchoring is when you come to a diagnosis in your mind, and no matter what information is presented to you, you don't change your mind about that diagnosis. So if somebody has a right lower quadrant pain, I think I'm seeing them in the emergency department, I think they've got appendicitis, and no matter what I do, information-wise, I don't change my mind, no matter what information comes in. Or you might somebody think is somebody is just plain old crazy. 
and you're convinced that they're crazy. And no matter what information comes to you, you don't change your mind on the diagnosis. That's called anchoring. And when we anchor on a diagnosis, we miss things. And that can get us in trouble. So this is the patient care report. You can see initially a GCS was 15. And then about 10 minutes later, GCS went down to 14. That was our very first indication 10 minutes later. And by this time, they were 10 minutes into the ride and the GCS went down. Um, they gave some oxygen, they gave some fentanyl, that's okay. Uh, when they got to the emergency room, the emergency room doctor saw her, a C collar was in place and the GCS went down and he said, uh, something doesn't look right, right here in the right shin, there was a wooden stick uh, stuck in her shin and here were her vital signs, a pulse of 109, temperature, that didn't make much difference. Respirations were 18, but 50 over palp on a manual cuff. When the patient got to the emergency room, of course, we cut all that clothes off. And what do you think we found where the patient had Peter pants? Anybody want to guess? Go ahead and type it in. Um, Nope, the stick was not in the shin. That's a good guess. Um, it wasn't in the bladder. It was blood is the question, and that's right. This lady, uh, that's a good guess that the stick from the shin penetrated, but it was actually going in and out. You could see it was in the shin, but she had hit so hard that that was not urine. It was blood, and had we cut the clothes off at the scene, we would have seen that the patient was cut from her rectal area to her vaginal area, and she had kind of sheared. So it became pretty obvious on the physician's palpation that she had an unstable pelvis, and so he started moving very quickly to get her going. Um, a, B, C, D, E, you can see this is, this is the ER doctor's thing here, and you can see he goes through A, B, C, D, E, disability exposure. Uh, exposed, warm, etc. Um, and this is more of the pelvis exam. It's unstable. Uh, pubic laceration extends through the labia majoria to the right side of the rectum, eight centimeters in length. So that's pretty long. Eight centimeters in length is four inches or so. This is the blood count that was done initially. You don't have to know much about it, except that here's a normal 12 and 37, and this lady had 10, 4, and 33. So all that blood was already gathering in her pelvis. So uh, he looked at the x-ray. Uh, there were no rib fractures, no pneumothorax. Uh, he started a central line and he intubated her. And uh, this x-ray here, on the right is after intubation. On the left, you don't get the ability to do this in the field. But when we put a tube in, we know it goes in the right place, sometimes by not only visualizing and watching through the cords, but here we can see that there's no pneumothorax. But here's actually where the problem was there. So you can see on the left-hand side, this is how far away her pelvis is. And pelvises are shaped like a cone. Uh, this isn't a math class, but if you go back to your basic uh, uh, math 101, the cone of the pelvis is here and here, and it takes a whole lot of fluid to fill up that cone. So when pelvic bones get disrupted like this, it tears through arteries, it tears through soft tissue. The first thing that, that you would use in the field, a um, SAM splint or a pelvic splint. What the doctor who took care of this person did is just tied a sheet uh, as hard as he could around and put the sheet around the pelvis and he got it in pretty darn good position. Once he did this, her blood pressure stabilized. So if we go back to our first anchoring diagnosis and missed injury, had we done a better physical exam, I think we would not have missed this or suspected it, we would have done okay. Um, this is three days after the accident. You can see she had a whole lot of fluid uh, 
This x-ray looks abnormal, but you can see, uh, I'm gonna go back a couple and see how clear these are, these fields are, uh, mostly gray area here. And then we jump ahead a couple of days. This person is beginning to drown in what's called adult respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. It's kind of like congestive heart failure. And unfortunately, this was not a head injury. This was the anoxic injury because she coded on us several times. And this was probably brain damage. And eventually she was taken off the respirator. So a question is, I'd worry about causing more tissue damage, wrapping a sheet around that big fracture and then moving the bones back together. Well, that's a, a pretty good question, tissue damage, but you have a SAM splint. A SAM splint's available to you. Um, yes, there are things we do in the emergency department that um, you might not do in the field, but if you had nothing, I would go with a sheet, but you certainly should have in your protocol SAM splints and they're okay. Um, even though, okay, I imagine it's only corrected by surgery. Actually, the only, when I go in there, the question is, would it be corrected by surgery? And, and, the, and the question is, she went to surgery, but what she really needed was an interventional radiologist. That means a radiologist who sneaks. I'm going to go back a couple x-rays here. Um, uh, let's go to this one. A radiologist who puts a catheter in the groin and snakes the catheter up to where the bleeding is, and he sends an electric current through there and coagulates the vessel, and that's really the best way to do it. That's also an important indication of why going to a level three versus a level two, because some level threes aren't gonna have interventional radiology. And remember, all politics is local, right? So you have to know what your hospital has the ability to, to take care of um, and what your local protocols are. They're all gonna be slightly different. So this lady went to surgery, but there was nothing that they could actually tie off or fix but unfortunately, all the damage had been done. Now, did this cause a problem? And the answer is, whoops, sorry. Did this cause a problem? Was the paramedic wrong? No. The treatment was okay. It's just they anchored on a diagnosis, and they probably should have gone back one more and thought about it. That's it. Any other questions about... Um, this particular case and missed injuries. All right, I'm gonna leave you with this little vignette. You wanna be good paramedics, you don't wanna be like these guys. Okay, any questions? All right, very good. Good. All right, you're welcome everybody. Uh, let me see. I'm gonna stop the video. Good. And we'll see you next time. Any other? All right. Thank you, Dr. Eschelbach. And real quick, if you got questions, send them now. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll right. see you next time. All right. Uh, good night. Anything else I need to do? I'm done, right? Okay. You're done. We'll, we'll go ahead and close it out. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night. You will. You too.